download the last set of notes. We are in the very last chapter of biology. I think it's quite apt that we end off this week because actually, if you go to university and take biology, this is one of the foundations of everything you would. This is one of the foundations that you use to study uh, biology as a whole. In this last chapter, we build upon whatever you've learned across your entire biology life. It is very related to the previous chapter. So let's do a quick recap of what you've done so far. First and foremost, in the previous chapter, our previous chapter is called inheritance. What do we inherit? At the end of the day, we are inheriting genes. And when we look at genes, there are many combinations of genes, many different versions of genes. Depending on the combination you, you inherit, that's what we refer, refer to as genotype. It is the phenotype that we refer to as the characteristics that you observe. We tend to relate phenotype to things you can see. But phenotype is anything that your DNA can transcribe and be translated into proteins. So even an enzyme, the presence of an enzyme is counted as phenotype. Your hair color is also a phenotype. Your blood type is also a phenotype. But if there's one thing common across every part, is that when you look at blood type, it's also a result of different proteins on the red blood cell surface. Your hair color the result of proteinaceous pigments. Enzymes, result of proteins. So, when we talk about phenotypes, really, we are grounded at the end of the day in proteins. But the proteins will be structural, will be pigment, will be enzymes, so on and so forth. Okay. So, and that's where we are so far, with genotypes and phenotypes. We also learned about the various ways genotypes can interact with each other. Or the NUs can interact with each other. For example, they can interact via a complete dominance. They can also interact via co-dominance. And these are the two that we mainly look at. Uh, other than that, sorry, there's one more. We also look at sex-linked traits. These are the various ways that your LU combinations can interact with each other. In some instances, in the previous chapter, we learned that we sometimes can encounter multiple alleles. Not just two. We are very used to seeing just a capital A or a small A, which relates to dominance and recessiveness. But sometimes you may encounter multiple alleles. For example, blood type is a very clear example where we have a few more alleles than we usually deal with. So this is where we were in our previous chapter. But I think the next chapter that we're going into deals with inheritance not on individual levels, not on a short term, but on a very large scale. What happens if we look at inheritance on a population scale over a long period of time? You find that 
very often the population that came before and the population after many, many, many generations, the proportion of individuals with a particular phenotype will change. You may start off with a population with a few individuals with a phenotype, but over many, many, many generations, we find that many of the individuals may end up with a phenotype. Okay. But so far, we've really been looking at inheritance on a very short-term scale. This is really short-term. But where we are going now, long-term. And what we are going to focus on is this part. What is causing or influencing the change in proportion of phenotypes from one population after many generations to the, the end state? Okay, that's where we are. This change in phenotype, proportion of phenotype, you may have heard of this word before, the word is evolution. As a biologist, when I say the word evolution, I mean to say that I'm looking at a population. How is it that over many generations, one population, the proportion of phenotypes in this uh, population can change over many generations? That's what evolution is. Evolution is not, it's a change in proportion of phenotypes over a very long period. And if you understand the mechanisms that can lead to evolution, then you can start to question how things came to be. And why people say uh, chickens and dinosaurs are very related to each other. Or that humans and monkeys are very related to each other. With that, we begin this chapter. Uh, broadly speaking, these are the outcomes that we are going to look at. It's rather short. So there are two parts to this final chapter, just segment A and segment B. In segment A, we're going to look at the mechanisms that can lead to this change in proportion of phenotypes. The mechanism that we are going to focus on is natural selection. There are many different mechanisms that can lead to a change in proportion of phenotypes. But as a beginner, we learn natural selection as it is, as a base mechanism. When you go to SH type, you'll learn that there are a few more mechanisms. After natural selection, then we'll go into the artificial form of selection. The thing that humans always do, so that we can cause directly the change in proportion of emotions. Okay, so a quick recap. By the way, when we look at Pokemon, this was my first encounter of the word evolution. 
Visual word evolution, you think of, oh, this one, oh, then turns into this, and turns into this. Huh? Oh, for example, you look at Eevee as a Pokemon. Oh, then you say, oh, this Pokemon can evolve into all these different versions. Okay, so that's one idea of evolution. Then sometimes, uh, the classic example of evolution, you just click evolution. Okay. You click evolution into, into Google Images, very often they just show you this image. They always show you this classic image of a monkey walking to become a human. Yeah? This image gives you many misconceptions. It almost implies that gorilla became monkey. Okay, sorry, monkey became human. But that's far from the truth. Okay, as we go through this chapter, I hope you come to see how inaccurate and how much misconception this particular image gives. Monkey did not become us. Monkey and us, we came from the same ancestor. That would be a better way of looking at it. Okay. But before we deal with all the other case studies that you may have seen in, on the internet, today we will look at something a little bit more uh, relatable, something that will, will help us ground our understanding what natural selection as a mechanism is. Here, I'd like to show you a case study. This is not a case study you must memorize, but a very good case study to help us understand this process of natural selection. Okay, natural selection. Nothing more than a process. Before I start this video, I would like you to pay attention to these three questions. When you get the answer to these, these three questions along the way, will you fill it in to the tool, interactive thinking tool, and then we will listen to each other's viewpoints. Okay? So you see one, two, three corresponds to questions one, two, and three. Okay? So these are the three questions. Anchor them in your mind as we go through the video. First one, what type of variation does the phenotype fur color exhibit? Okay. When I ask you for what type of variation, I'm asking you, is it incomplete? Okay, what would you call it? Sorry, discontinuous? Is it discontinuous variation? Or is it continuous variation that you're observing in this case study? Okay, so that's question one. Second one, they're asking what caused the variation. And I want you to focus on the word cause. What really caused the variation you observe in the population? Third one, is dark fur color good or bad? Okay, with that as the context, we're going to look at this very cute and interesting case study of how phenotypes, the proportion change over a long period of time. Across the American South, Golden deserts dotted by cacti and brush stretch for miles. Yet here in Mexico's Valley of Fire, the landscape changes dramatically. Patches of black rock interrupt the sand, remnants of volcanic eruptions that occurred about 1,000 years ago. The eruptions spewed a river of lava more than 40 miles long across the desert. It darkened, leaving any creature dependent upon camouflage in serious trouble. In the complex battle of life, one of the constant struggles between seeing and not being seen, the evolutionary game of hide and seek. When you come here to the Valley of Fire in New Mexico, a battlefield, to find one of the tiniest soldiers and what it can teach us about how evolution works. On the desert sands, the rock pocket mouse blends in perfectly, its light-colored fur concealing it from predators. But on dark lava, the same fur makes the mouse stand out, attracting the many creatures that see it. These mites are the Snickers bar of the desert. They're eaten by foxes and, and coyotes and, and rattlesnakes, and certainly by owls, and maybe and most of those predators are visual predators. So what happened to the pocket mice that found themselves on this new terrain? When I accompanied biologist Michael Nachman onto the law firm, it doesn't take long to find out. Well, this one's first. Nachman has been collecting 
left in mice, unharmed in traps. And then it's a dark one. It is, yeah. Now, are most of the ones you find up here dark? Almost all of them. Not only have the mice here evolved to be as dark as the mushroom, the color change has occurred precisely where it concealed them from hunters. So a bit of a light in your belly, too. That's right. All of the dark ones here and around a lot of those have a light in your belly because in the there's no selection for dark on the belly because predators are coming to the bottom. Left to themselves, the mice show no preference for light or dark rocks. It's the predators that have made the difference. The change in color over evolutionary time in the population is driven by predators weeding out the mice that don't match their pattern. But how did the dark mice arise in the first place? When a black mouse appears in a light population of mice, that is usually going to be due to a new mutation. And those are random and rare events. To fully understand the pocket mouse transformation, Nachman moves from the lava to the lab. He and his team extract DNA from light and dark mice taken from one desert region. The aim? To find one or more genetic mutations that cause dark coloration. A mutation is a change in the chemical letters that make up our genes. It's a copying error that may occur when our cells divide. Mutation seems to mean that something bad is happening. Well, mutations are neither good or bad. Whether they are favored, or whether they are rejected, or whether they're just neutral, depends upon the conditions an organism finds itself. So for the pocket mouse, a mutation that causes the mouse to turn black, that is good if you're living on black rock, and it's bad if you're living out in the sandy desert. The light mice are all fur color. Fur color is a trait controlled by many genes. Nachman focuses on how these genes differ in dark and light mice. One by one, the genes prove identical, but at last, something does turn up. The difference between dark and light mice boils down to a difference of four chemical letters in a gene called MC101. Because the gene controls the amount of dark pigment in a mouse's hair follicles, a mouse with these mutations grows dark fur which gives it an advantage on a dark background. But still, that's one mouse. How would its dark fur spread to a whole population? This lava flow is about a thousand years old. And so you might wonder, is, had there been enough time, it's only been a thousand years, it's a very short period of time, for a new mutation to come along and spread so that all of the mice on this lava flow are black, because really they all are. Indeed. Such a rapid spread of the mutation may seem unlikely, until you do the math. And the reason is that while only one new mouse born in 100,000 may be black, hundreds of thousands of mice are born in any given year. And then those mice that are black have enough advantage that their babies do better, and they have more offspring, and their offspring have more offspring. And just about a 5% advantage compounded year in and year out can very quickly turn the whole population black, as we see today. If the dark color gives mice a 1% competitive advantage, and you start with 1% of the population being dark, in about 1,000 years, 95% of the mice will be dark. If instead, dark color gives them a 10% advantage, and it only takes 100 years. Thanks to Nachman and mice, science has an example of evolution crystal clear in every detail. Hey, let me hear your thoughts. Three questions. First one, what type of variation is this? So this is a recap of the previous chapter. What caused the variation? Last one, is dark fur color good or bad?
once you do that done, you can explore a computer simulation of what we've just spoken about. If you were to click on the second tab, you find that there's a link. This is what you bring you to. I love this simulation. Here, all these tiny circles represent the pocket mics. These are the brown versions. Then you see the black versions. Then you see one big ball coming down the soup in. Those are the hawks coming in to take away the mics. You can simulate what was said in the story. Go and create this volcanic eruption where it starts to spill lava all over the place. You see what happens over many generations. Okay, I shall leave it here while I go back to our point. Responses. If you look across the board, okay, as I scan across the board, I see that first question is this discontinuous or continuous? We will classify this as a form of discontinuous variation because you find two distinct categories. You don't find a range of black all the way to brown. It is either brown or black. Okay, so we say it's discontinuous, like your blood type. The second question was, what caused the mutations? And as I scan across the board, I think there seems to be two causes of variation. First one, first category uh, of causes, I see, for example, Zoe says, predators weeding out pocket mice with the alley of light fur. So those with the color, the color of fur gives, okay, so the color, the correct color, the right color of fur gives a high chance of survival. Okay, Santosh also says, it was the environment, when you look at the molten rock from the volcano eruption, it was the environment that caused the variation because the predators came in to soup in the light colored mines. Serene on the other hand says, it's the random mutations. The random mutations is what caused the, the variation. Rin says the mutation is the cause. Okay, so does Ishin. So if we scan across the board, we are split into two categories. It's either the mutation that caused the variation, or we say that it's the volcanic eruption that caused the variation. So which one? Okay, I think therefore it comes down to how we interpret what it means by cause. Because to me, when I hear the word cause, I am referring to the source. What is the source of the variation? What caused the variation to begin with? And if we say that the variation is either dark fur or light colored fur, then what caused this variation? Well, what caused this variation is down to the genes. Right? If we look at your DNA, your DNA coded for the fur color, but because of a slight change in the allele sequence, DNA sequence, you find that you get a totally different phenotype. We find that a new variation has occurred. So, take note, what causes variation is mutations. So then, what would be, what does the, what's the environment role in this? How might we describe the environment's role in the variation we see? The environment changes the proportion of this variation. It doesn't cause it, but it can change the proportion of it. Okay? So there is a distinction we should make. The environment that the mice lives in can change the proportion of this variation, but we cannot cause it. To say that the environment caused the variation is to say this. Okay, of course, I need to remember what I said. To say that the environment caused the variation. environment cause variation is to say this. Imagine this is a population of mice with white fur, brown fur. When the volcano erupted and spilled lava onto this area, 
right? To say that the environment caused the variation is to say that okay, somehow the lava is causing the mice to end up changing the fur color. Okay? But the lava did not do that. The lava did not cause the mice to spontaneously mutate to have this fur color. Okay? So that is an inaccurate way to look at the, the case study. Last question was, then is black fur color good or bad? If a, put it very simply, she says, it depends on what background it lives on. If we look, well, actually the answers get more and more elongated. Dark fur color is good on dark lava, but light fur, light colored fur is better in the desert. So is it good or bad? Sarah says, both. Because it depends on where the mice lives on. If you're on a lighter sand, black is bad. If you're on a dark lava, light fur color is bad. And that is a trademark to understand natural selection. A lot of us think that mutations are necessarily bad. It's not really the case. Actually, all the variation we see among us is a result of mutations. We are highly mutated when we compare individual to individual. But that doesn't stop us from living our daily lives. It's just that I got bigger nose than Ishena, right? But is that necessarily bad? No, my wife likes a bigger nose, right? So it's not necessarily bad. Hair color, right? My hair color is this color, your hair color is made that. Yours may be curly, mine may be not. Not all mutations are bad. Some mutations are good, or some mutations are bad. But it really depends on the environment. God knows, maybe 100 years down the road, some sort of calamity occurs where it requires a big dose to be able to filter the air. Now, then you should your, your family life or that thing. But mine will exist for much longer. I'll get to pass on my big dose gene. Okay? For many generations. Okay? So, a little bit about the foundation of natural selection. And then we go back to the simulation and see what happens to that poor population after we blast the volcano. Ah, hey, what in the world? The simulation failed, huh? it's not going to happen. Oh, I think there's a problem. Okay, earlier on, okay, now, now, now we start to see, now we start to see the black mice occur. Okay, just now, when I switched to the simulation, I observed that there were only brown mice. There were no black mice in the population. So when I swapped it over, right, to black color lava, nothing really happened. But it just goes to show one thing. Can natural selection occur without variation in the population? Meaning to say, if you look at the population of mice, if we don't observe any variation, will there be natural selection? I would like to introduce some terms to you today to help us make sense of this story so that you can better describe this process. So, a few terms. Number one, selective advantage. Okay, you can use this word in your vocabulary to help to describe the the whole flow of natural selection. Selective advantage. If we look at this land with black lava, which fur color has the selective advantage? So that is what selective advantage, how it can be used. Selective because the environment is selecting for something. Which one has the advantage? So then you see depending on the environment. So that's how you can use the word selective advantage. Which fur color has a selective advantage? I would say the black fur color has a selective advantage in the lava environment. The second word I'd like to introduce is the word selective pressure. Selective pressure is what causes change in proportion of the variation over time. Who was that? <laughs> we look at this case 
study. What do you think is the selective pressure here? What is causing the change in proportion of the variation we observe? What is the selective pressure? Okay, have a quick buzz among yourselves. What is the selective pressure? Can okay, anyone don't literally buzz up? visual predators, the hawks. Okay. Then, then, then we do a... Oh no, then, then we think of... So, which one, uh, if we take away, we won't find a change in variation, a uh, change in proportion of the variation. Okay. Which is more important to cause the change in proportion of the variation. The predator or the color of the dog? Interestingly, actually the color of the ground, there will always be a color, right? There will always be a color. Volcano or not? If there's no volcano, no eruption, then the color will be this color. If there is a volcanic eruption, the color will change. The predator also always stays, right? The predator always stays. But if I swap between colors, from one color to the next, we observe that the Proportion of the variation changes. Switch to black, the proportion of variation starts to change. I switch swap back the other way, I observe the reverse happens to the population. Especially what is the pressure here? The pressure is the one that really affects the survivability of the generator. Yeah? Uh, the, the pigeons are not pigeons. The hawks, yeah, pigeons cannot eat. The hawks. Yeah, the hawks are the ones that are causing a, uh, there is a pressure. So as a student, I need you to be able to identify two things. Every time we look at a case study for natural selection, usually we'll provide you case studies. The first one is, can you identify which, what is the selective advantage in this particular context? Because uh, if the starting context was that it's a volcanic ground, then a sandstorm came. Then the selective advantage in this environment is different. Yeah? Which fur color is a selective advantage now? It's the brown fur color, not the black one. But if I flip the other way, then the selective, the cold color with the selective advantage is the one with black color, not the brown one. So, you must be able to identify the selective advantage based on the environment you, you, you be. Second, you must be able to identify the selective pressure. What is directly causing the change in proportion of the variation? Two more, two more words that I would like to introduce that you can use to better describe this narrative. So, you can say, you can use the word select for, select against. You can use in a sentence and say that, okay, the selecting pressure, it selects for a particular trait. It selects against a particular trait. Sorry, I, I rephrase that. Huh? The selective pressure and select for or select against. You can say that a particular trait is selected for or a particular trait is selected against. So the trait with the selective advantage will be selected for 
the trade will be the selective disadvantage will be selected against. Okay, I'll give an example of how to use it in a sentence. So you could use it in this way. One could say that, if I look at the story again, when we look at a population, the cause of variation is mutation. So we find that in the population, randomly, there may be one individual or a few individuals with the black fur. But because there is the black fur confers, you can say the black fur confers a selective advantage. Black fur confers a selective advantage. In this context, the top is the selective selection pressure. Over time, we observe that the trait for black color is selected for by the environment. While the trait of brown color is selected against by the environment. So that's how you can use the sun cup. So this trait is selected for. This one is selected against. Selected for, that means the trait that the environment deems to be no more suitable for survival. Okay, the environment is not deemed, uh, the environment has no The ones they are selected for, actually they end up having a higher chance of survival as well as reproduction. That is how we find more and more individuals over time having a particular trait. Higher chance of survival and reproduction, such that by the end state, uh, you may end up finding lots and lots and lots of mice with black fur because they were constantly being selected for by the environment, while those with orange fur constantly being selected against. Those with black fur, because they have a better chance of survival and reproduction, their proportion start to increase over time because they pass the LU on. Yes? Oh, good question. Why can't the mice just migrate? Okay, if the mice could migrate, we would, we may not observe natural selection occurring. If the mice, very often natural selection occurs when they are bound by the environment. So for example, there could have been a lot of valleys at the site, which is actually the case. Uh, when I went to research a little bit more, there are lots of valleys, the mines are trapped, so they have nowhere to go. So they, they are being selected for. But then uh, across the valley, there's also another population of mines that didn't have the volcano. They happily still have having that brown color. Yeah. In fact, uh, the interesting thing is that in that whole zone, there are some pockets of valleys, then some areas that also have volcanoes, some don't have. You'll find that in those areas with lava and if they are bound by valleys, right, they tend to be dark colored. Then those that are elsewhere and sandy, they tend to be brown colored. So movement, migration does affect, but if they cannot migrate, natural selection will already take its full force. Okay. 
What is continuous variation? Right. Okay, so if it's continuous variation, natural selection can still act upon the population. It's just that I think you we use the case study of this continuous variation quite very clear. Right? Over time you see that it changes from the population are from brown to mostly black color. But if it's continuous variation, what you find is that Okay, in this continuum, uh, you start to see a skew of what we originally observed as a bell curve. If natural selection, the pressure is for this direction, you'll find that over time, the bell curve will start to shift. If the direction for selection is the other way, let's say shortness, okay, I'm using height again. Let's say shortness is a good thing. You rest short, you can hide in the bushes, then you run around, eagles cannot see you, right? Okay, uh, then the selection pressure may end up selecting for a short, the bell curve will start to shift the other way. So continuous variation also can. Yeah? So then, uh, students will then ask, uh, is natural selection equals evolution? No, it's not the same thing. Evolution describes how there is a change in proportion of variation over time. But what causes that change? It is natural selection. So natural selection is a cause for evolution. If I rephrase it, evolution is nothing more than summarizing and saying that evolution is a change in proportion. But what causes that change? The process is natural selection. And perhaps it makes a little bit more sense if I give you one more example of how the proportion of variation can change over time. why we in the world we have. Okay, you see, if, if the trait still exists in us, right, it must mean that there must have been some advantage to it, right? No matter what our eyebrows for. Right? We must have been selected. This trait must have been selected for, right? For, right, if you look at our, um, our um, common relatives, right, you'll find that uh, some monkeys don't have eyebrows. How we have eyebrows? Right? This the trait must have been selected for. For what reason? What do you all think? I mean, I have can only brainstorm. Uh, they are in the Google. I also don't know, but I speculate. What do you think eyebrows are for? Has it been selected for, right? Sorry? Right, right, right. So, researchers speculate they may be, it may help us with sweat, um, UV directing sweat. Because you perspire, right? Imagine you don't have this bushy brow over here, right? Then all the sweat as you run, right? Chasing mammoths, right? Then the sweat just goes directly into your eyeballs and scotch it as you're running. Yeah? Perpetual eye drops as you're running up. But with this eyebrow here, it helps to like trap it here, maybe redirect it a little bit. I also read that eyebrows are really good for human species for emotions. Right? With my, I tell you if I shave off my eyebrows, right, I think it takes away an element of emotion. You cannot tell what I'm feeling. Yeah? <laughs> Can you imagine yourselves without eyebrows? I think really you you take away a lot of emotion. Then, right? Why why did we evolve this? Why why did our population evolve? What is it standing up right? What selection pressure might have caused us to stand up right? Uh, I I find it most interesting to think about what the selection pressure might be. Right? If if the, a trait exists in a population, it must sort of mean that there must have been some sort of pressure resulted in us as a population selecting for this trait. But in reality, there are some traits that are neutral. Either good or bad. All we know, hair that's straight or curly, either good or bad. The mutation just occurred, the environment doesn't, uh, there's no selection pressure for it, so it just, perfect, uh, it just continues to exist. But a lot of times, it exists because there is a Selective advantage. So if you go and think about it. Okay, uh, as I was saying earlier on, natural selection is just one of the mechanisms for evolution. There are many other ways the proportion of variation in 
the population can change. For example, the case study we gave was because volcano erupted, then changed the landscape color. The hawks that came in can see one, cannot see the other. And that caused a change. But you know what could have caused a change in proportion of aeration also? You see where these dark colored lines are? I have placed them over here. Imagine that uh, the volcano did something else. Imagine the volcano didn't just change the color, it also wiped out a large proportion of the population. What should happen, sir? Uh? Right now, the proportion looks like that. Okay? But if the volcano wiped out, the lava itself uh, totally killed off the mines. And all I'm left with are three black mines and two brown mines. Have I changed the proportion of variation? I also have. Yeah? And in this scenario now, the proportion has changed. That also can cause the change of proportion. So there are many mechanisms to evolution, not just selective pressures. Sometimes catastrophes can change the proportion altogether. So catastrophe. Sometimes catastrophes can cause evolution to occur. study we will show you all the simple simple ones there are a lot more other than uh, color and camouflage but let's show you another very classic example it really happened for those of you that study history and geography you have heard about the industrial revolution yeah the industrial revolution actually had an impact on natural selection on a particular species of moth
There's one more, do you see it? The light colored moths have an advantage for survival. Their color helps them to blend into their environment and hide from hungry predators like birds. The dark colored tree was a disadvantage. Moths with this tree were more easily spotted by predators and had a lower chance of survival. Since the light colored tree had an advantage for survival, it was more commonly seen in the population. This was due to natural selection. Individuals who are best suited for an environment survive longer, reproduce more times, and pass on their genes. Natural selection over many generations can cause the noticeable evolutionary changes in a species, and the peppered moth is a perfect example. In the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution took place. Manual labor was taken over by machinery. Factories began to produce goods. These factories were powered by coal. The burning of coal released a lot of pollution. Dark clouds of soot and ash lingered in the air and even settled on the trees. Over time, the once light colored trees were covered in a layer of dark soot. Which color variation had the advantage after industrialization changed the environment? The dark colored moths now had Questions to close out natural selection. You have to think up. Number one, can individuals evolve? Okay, number two, do mutations arise in response to the environment? Three, can natural selection occur without variation? Okay. What do you think? Many, uh, I mean, it really depends on 
I do not mean time. I mean many generations. Because if you look at bacteria or viruses, they are within a, a short time span of, of one day, many generations will have occurred. Evolution could have occurred just within 24 hours. You get human population, we we need to first find a girlfriend boyfriend, they get married, they have kids. It takes many generations, thousands and thousands of years for evolution to really be obvious. But for bacteria, it's different. So, not just the idea of time in terms of scale, but also number of generations. Okay, do mutations arise in response to the environment type? That's a very interesting question. Because, okay, so this student asks, uh, I mean, we, we answered this question earlier on whether do mutations arise in response to the environment. Because to, to this student, he felt that did the black mines occur because they observed that there was a black environment? Uh, no. This, they occurred from mutation. Then he asked, hey, what about stress lines, uh, black? Lava, then just nice got one mouse with black fur. Right? Come so so what a coincidence. Really it's a chance event. Because uh, when you look at this population, there are also other mutations that exist. Perhaps there's a mutation that results in the mice. Okay, perhaps there's another mutant here when the mice has super big ears. Perhaps there's another mutant over here. 
where the mice has big nose. And then there's this mutant here with black colored fur. Actually, within a population, there are tons of mutants. But it depends on what the environment is, what the selection pressure is, that certain mutations will be selected for or against. In this case, uh, in this particular context, we didn't make mention to all the other mutants because it's irrelevant. They are, in a sense, neutral. Because the... Oh, or, or maybe it's not, uh, Sorry, I think it's neutral, but as I draw a mice with big ears, I can see how it can be advantageous. Yeah, maybe you can hear the, pre the predator better. They could be selected for. Okay, so the reality is that there are many mutations. Uh, it's just that this particular case study only focuses on that one mutation that that makes sense in this context. Okay, because we should what we we shouldn't go away is to think that we can respond to the environment. Uh, what we can respond to is when we say we adapt. Uh, what we can respond to is, let's say you go to a cold environment, then you just go out cold and make yourself feel warmer. Yeah? You're in a hot place, you're going to a colder place. That is you adapting, but you cannot evolve. It's not like I, it's a hot day, then I, my skin becomes thinner. Or if it's a cold environment, I automatically grow more fur. Uh, that would be quite crazy. Yes, but it's up. Oh, okay. Is black color fur recessive? Okay, I can't remember. Did the video make mention whether it's recessive or not? Okay, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, but that's a good question. Does recessiveness and dominance, does it play a role in natural selection? Okay. When you look at dominance or recessiveness, actually natural selection is kind of unbiased to whether you are dominant or recessive. It is at the end of the day whether that trait has a selective advantage. Let's say black fur is recessive, it doesn't matter. Because black fur confer an advantage, it can end up being spread across the population over many generations. Okay? So dominance or recessiveness, uh, natural selection is unbiased. Yes? Okay, let's say there's no black mites, and then Lava, black environment, no black mines, all of them are like that. Would the whole population go extinct? There's a chance. Which, which goes back to the idea of why we need variation in our population. Because if we are all one and the same, you just need the right calamity, the right selection pressure, and the whole population will be gone. And that's why we are so you know, caught up with ensuring that we have genetic variety. Every time individuals mate, we produce sperm and egg, there's variety, genetic variety in our sperm and egg, it all goes down to ensuring that we have variety in this pool. The moment we are all the same, we risk the population going extinct if the right to them results. Okay? Yes? Why is it that Okay, so you may have heard that if, uh, okay, a lot of royalty, uh, they, they tend to inbreed. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure modern day, but in the past, uh, there's a lot of inbreeding in royalty because they felt like uh, royalty can only mate with royalty. So as a result, siblings can meet with cousins, siblings to siblings. And you, you often find that the offspring end up looking or having a lot of genetic defects on the surface. It's not a result of mutation, but it's a result of a lot of recessive diseases starting to show. For example, if you have two, a king and a queen that is probably alright, but they may be homozygous, heterozygous, and they have children that are homozygous recessive for the disease, and then maybe another two children that look normal, but actually are heterozygous, I tell you, if these two siblings come together, there's a good chance that they will have offspring, they will have the disease. What? <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, meow, meow, meow. I was like, okay. Yeah. Imagine if we keep
keep doing this, uh, it's a good chance you end up having a pure pet a royal family line that has a lot of the homozygous recessive genotypes. Yeah. So it's not so much of mutations uh, arising, but it is the family line and end up getting more and more homozygous recessive. Composition, right? Okay, the word composition and proportion here, same meaning, huh? Marginatic, what? 
Oh, genetic composition, because it's CR, when you look at individual, we are made of many genes, right? So, we are changing the genetic composition of the population over time. Over time, the population, when you look at their, their, the genes that they have, over time, you look at their individual, uh, you tend to find more individuals with this particular version of the allele. So their genetic composition does, does change. But, you notice when I say the proportion of the trait changes, very often I sort of just referring to the allele, right? The proportion of the allele in the population changes over time, right? But the allele, when you look at it, uh, not look at it disjointed from the, the whole individual as well. So when they say the genetic composition change, it's not inaccurate to say that because you know, the allele is still part of the entire makeup of the genetic composition. But uh, I understand where that confusion might come, but I don't think it's trying to mean that. evolution to describe how Character flaw, right? Yeah, something like that. Okay, so if 
it's true lah. I okay. I, I do I do wonder, you know, in modern day, actually uh, I should have been selected again. You know, when I was very very young, I had I think I told you before I had super high fever, went up to forty plus. But right, I should have been selected again. Clearly, my immune system was not good enough for this world. But doctor came in, placed me in an ice bucket, and just soaked me until my temperature went down. Because after I was only like, I think I told you, only a few months back that my father told me that they actually injected a particular chemical into direct into my spinal cord to make sure that my whole nervous system and my whole body cools down. Uh, because my even my nervous system and my brain was always big. I put this smarter. So yeah, so I should have been selected against, but what medical science kept me. That means to say, uh, I'm gonna pass this lousy yes, immune system to the next generation, you know. Yeah. Um, so um, is evolution still taking place? Perhaps in ways that medi medicine cannot cover. Yeah? If medicine hasn't reached a point where there are certain traits that we cannot, you know, prevent the environment from selecting for uh, or against, this particular trait is still evolved. Perhaps we are evolving in ways of in the unseen. We we are very we are very aware of diseases, things that we observe, these are things that evolve. But perhaps it's unseen that it's still evolving. Uh, if you just Google, are humans still evolving? The answer is yes. We are still evolving. But perhaps not in the obvious sense of evolution. Yes? At what point do we draw a line and say, Right, okay. So what line do we draw? But when do we draw the line? Uh, we draw the line when a new species cannot mate with the old one. Yeah? Okay, so very often, right, when a species diverges so much, they evolve so much, right, they are, even their reproductive parts cannot, are not compatible anymore. Yeah. So their reproductive parts are not compatible, their behavior may be very different, they are adapted to different environments such that they no longer will meet each other again. Yeah. So, but usually it has to do with the biology of it, the reproductive organs, the, the internal you know, reproductive system is no longer compatible. But how do we know that? Like, if the hypothetical, if like, it's like, 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 like,